Hello and welcome to this review of my Chiron Telesystems Model 4044 keyboard. Now, now we're talking. It seems you guys like videos about keyboards that are in some way completely over the top. So for this one, I suggest you get the popcorn out. I'm sure that many of you know by now that I like big, heavy keyboards, and this thing is really just off the scale. Compare basically any other keyboard to it, and this thing makes it, whatever it is, look like a little pussy by comparison. This juggernaut is the single heaviest keyboard I've ever held. I know it probably looks a little bit on the weighty side, but jeez, this thing is bigly. Although it can't be weighed on my kitchen scales as it only goes to 5 kilos, I managed to weigh it on my parents' as people scales, and it comes out at 8.2 kilos. That's 18 pounds for you imperial folk out there. If you knock on it, there's basically no noise, the board is simply too massive and too heavy. Which, if you realize it's made out of 4.5 millimeter plate steel, is really not all that surprising. Just listen to the sound it makes when I knock on the top, man. That's the bowels of the earth rumbling. Do you know what they're doing? They're shitting themselves in fear of this monster. It's 11 centimeters tall, or 0.684 millimiles, if you prefer the imperial system, which is taller than even a beam spring keyboard. And although it's very, very nearly the width of an IBM Model F122, it's more than twice as heavy. If this is the IBM battleship, then this is the Chiron aircraft carrier. I mean, what the heck, man? Now, I know it looks a little bit like it's a whole computer, and in fact it comes with a massive mains power cord, but apart from the keyboard assembly and a power unit, there's basically not much else in there, so this really does appear to be just a keyboard. And I can show you that because it's remarkably easy to open it. Just untighten these four screws and slide the back out like this. I love good old engineering like that. Basically, all the components inside are marked with varying months of 1983, which sounds about right. That makes this one of my oldest keyboards. I have only a few that are even older. At the back are two massive ports for connecting it to the Chiron terminal, the power cord, a deliciously 80s power switch, a fuse, and the model plate telling us it's model 4044, made for Chiron Telesystems. I got this keyboard for $25 or something off of eBay a while ago, and it was very much worth it because it's obviously super cool and interesting, not to mention the fact that the name is just a single letter away from my alias, Giros. The switches are Keytronics Foman foil switches, but they're the older variant with the tall sliders, so I'll just call them Keytronic Vintage Foman foil for the moment. Presumably to comply with the 80s DIN norm, which specified that keyboards had to become low profile, they later designed a much shorter version that usually came with buckling rubber sleeves to create a tactile switch, but to my knowledge this older version has only ever been spotted in a linear version with an external coil spring. Considering the height of the slider well on these, I find it hard to imagine what kind of rubber sleeve they'd put on the tactile version of this anyway. The older ones are also marked Keytronic, Spokane, while the newer ones are generally unbranded. This switch, or perhaps their much rarer multi-block foam and foil arrangement, is sometimes referred to as the butterfly switch due to an old 80s advert Keytronic put up in which they claim that the tactile version was first, but this doesn't appear to actually be the case. Love that retro 80s look though, and fuck me, those keycaps. The switches are discrete modules, and they basically work as follows. I'll use one of the shorter, modern versions to explain it. The keyboard's PCB has two separate capacitive plates on it, and above that sits a foil disc, which, if you push a key, is pressed onto the plates, and then their capacitance changes. To allow for over-travel, and presumably to make the manufacturing tolerances a little bit looser, the foil disc sits on a foam pad that is affixed to the slider. This is where the term foam and foil comes from. 
because basically the whole inside of the switch is taken up by the foam and foil assembly, there is no room for an internal spring, and as a result, foam and foil switches are almost always seen with external return springs, such as the coil spring and buckling rubber sleeves shown here. Now, foam and foil switches have a rather sour reputation for having a very nasty, grainy key feel, which is usually attributed to decomposition of the foam in the pads, something that's unavoidable with age. When I reviewed this Wang with tactile foam and foil switches, I found it did indeed have an incredibly crap key feel. In fact, all of the five or so boards I've had with these switches did, but the foam in all of them was still completely intact. This left me to wonder if the shitty key feel was therefore inherent to the design, and if it would become even worse if the foam pads would degrade. The extreme irony of the situation, however, is that when I tried out these vintage foam and foil switches, they actually felt rather nice, much smoother than I'd felt before, and most importantly, it had none of the mushiness that foam and foil switches usually have, which is of course due to the foam in the switch. I mean, you're literally pressing down on a sponge. When I opened up the keyboard assembly, the reason for all of this suddenly became very clear, because these vintage foam and foil switches are older than the newer, short version, the foam in these switches had all rotten away, and I was basically just pressing down on the slider rather than on the spongy, mushy foam. In other words, these switches feel nice because they're broken. <laughs> that must be a first for this channel, and definitely not an indication of good quality. Still, as they are now, they're nice and smooth, albeit a bit on the stiff side. Also, the noise is pretty damn nice, listen to this. You can hear the mounting plate rather well, but the bottoming out noise makes up for it, I'd say. It should be noted that foam and foil switches do have many theoretical advantages to offer. Apart from being contactless and therefore potentially very smooth, they're rated for 100 million key presses per key, which is very impressive. And being capacitive, they possess inherent full N-key rollover. Another big advantage of these old Keytronics is their really nice keycaps. Before they started making crappy rubber dome keyboards, which is what they're most well known for nowadays, they used to make excellent double shot keycaps. These ones are a generation older than the typical Keytronic keycaps, and they look fairly amazing. They're super thick ABS, and the lettering is sharp as a whistle on them, and being double shot, it will never wear off. Also, they're quite colourful. They're still from that period when colours on a keyboard were considered normal, before everyone switched to all white, or all beige rather. The dark brown caps in particular look really gorgeous, goes to show how brown can be a very nice colour if done well. There's some cool red ones as well, like this red execute button, although as you'd expect the colour is kind of degraded, red dyes in general tend to be a little bit UV unstable. Because it's for some strange kind of telesystem, it's got lots of weird legends on it, of course, like autopause, end of message, roll and crawl, as if it was meant for dogs or something, a transfer button with very bad spelling, do, an Obama button, read, delay, and there's a whole set of font color buttons on the top as well. The layout is rather bizarre in places, with a control button all the way over here, and the nav in particular is very striking. It's a cross nav with extra keys coming diagonally out of it, like a starburst. It's quite unique, and they later used something similar for their more common duet keyboards, which are also enormous keyboards with an otherwise battleship-like layout. As many as 18 of the keycaps have little LED windows to act as status lights, such as to highlight which colour of font you're using at the moment, I'm guessing. Those use little clear light pipes, and they're actually triple-shot keycaps. Also, those switches are oriented upside down, have a little lamp hole in them, and the spring that's on them is completely different, presumably so as not to block the light underneath. Anyway, that's it for this week. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it and following is a typing demonstration of me typing on this keyboard.